It is true that some preach Christ out of envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. We are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Prescott Christian Church. If you're a newcomer with us, we're so glad to have you with us. I would love the opportunity uh, to meet you today out in the lobby. Off to the right, we have a place we call Pastor's Point, and I'll be hanging out there after the service. would welcome you to come by and introduce yourself before you leave. I want to welcome all of those who are joining us online from whenever and wherever you are. Uh, so glad to have you as a part of the Prescott Christian Church family. Family. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them on or turn them to Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, again, if you're a newcomer with us, we've been taking the last few months and working through this book of the Bible we call Philippians. It's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church there in Philippi. Um, and so we've been working our way through it, line by line, verse by verse. So you are catching us at the very end of this uh, sermon series. We've got one more message next week. But we're getting to the end. This is chapter four, and there's only four chapters in. And I just got to warn you today, the text reads like a letter. And, and what I mean by that is, whenever you're wrapping up a letter, it's kind of all of the little things that you didn't get in, and you just kind of start listing the stuff. And we're going to find today, he's going he's to remind us of some truths that he's already taught. He's going to make some personal appeals and some personal thanks in the end of this. He's going to make some practical applications here at the end, but they're all going to come pretty quick. And frankly, to be really honest, uh, I feel like today I've got like three sermons in one today. Okay, And so the good news is you just get to pick your own, right? So whichever one of these three apply to you, then you get to uh, pick your own ending. All right, so that's how this is going to go today. Philippians chapter 4, buckle up. We've got a lot to cover. Let's go. Chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Paul begins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. So this is Paul, again, ending his letter. He's landing the plane, and he starts the descent by saying, you people who I love, I've already told you that. You know that. Here's my big last push. This is what I'm trying to get you to do. Stand firm in the Lord. And again, it is a reminder. It's a reminder because this is, this is the whole central theme of the whole letter to the Philippians. In fact, let I me mean, back up to chapter 1. This is what he told us in chapter 1. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Live your life as if the gospel is actually glorious. Then, whether I come and see you only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in, one, in the one spirit. Or we could say it this way, stand firm in the Lord. The Lord is the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is how the letter began in chapter 1. This is what he's trying to get the church in Philippi to do and to be. Together as one, unified, striving together, standing as one, standing firm in the faith, not backing up, not backing down, but everybody moving forward together, standing together as one for the faith of the gospel. He'll say in chapter 2, having the same mind, being the same in one in spirit, this is what he wants for the church. Stand firm, stand together, be united for the sake of 
of the gospel. So that's the way he began this whole thing. And that's the way chapter 4 begins. Stand firm. Stand firm, church. Stand together. Be a part of something great for the sake of the gospel. Now, we all need reminders. But let's be honest. There are some of us who need a little more than just a general reminder, right? Because there are some, you've got some people, maybe you've birthed a person who you can give you can give general recommendations, you can give general warnings, you can give general rebukes, and somehow they only ever seem to think it applies to other people, right? There are some of us who are just hard-headed enough to think that the general warning or recommendation or command isn't really for us, it's for them. And sometimes we actually have to have somebody who's willing to stand up and say, no, 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 I'm talking about you. And then say our name out loud to help us understand. And that's what we're going to see here in chapter 4. Because he says, stand firm together as one for the gospel. That's what the church is supposed to be. But as he's wrapping up, he's going to tell us that there's actually a couple of ladies in the church who aren't doing this. Who aren't striving together as one for the faith. There's a couple of ladies in the church who aren't striving together. So Paul feels the need to address it publicly. Here's what he says. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. I've already told you twice, but you two, you ain't getting it. So let me say, Euodia, I'm talking to you. Syntyche, I'm talking to you. You all got to get on the same page, be of the same mind. Strive together. This is a well-known dispute in the church, right? Because here's how I know. Because it's not, he's not in Philippi when he's writing this to them. Paul is some 800 miles away on house arrest in Rome. It's literally a 213 hour by foot travel distance between Philippi and Rome. And word has gotten to Paul that Yodia and Syntyche can't get along, that there's some kind of disagreement between them. And it's so big that Paul feels the need to address it publicly. And again, I just think through this with me for a moment. Somebody got this letter from Paul, brought it back to the church and stood up and read this out loud to the church. Imagine if you're one of these two ladies. Somebody standing up there in their reading all, finally, brothers and sisters. And then I plead with Yodia. And I imagine everybody in the room went. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Because everybody knows these two have been bickering and fighting and every, and those two must just just sunk down. Here's the thought I had last night. All right. As I'm thinking about this. It, it's not just public knowledge in Philippi. Like this has now become like eternally public knowledge. <laughs> like every person who has a Bible knows about this fight between Yodi and Syntyche. Like think about, think about this for a second. These two are getting into heaven. Paul actually says here in a moment that their names are written in the book of life. I don't know if yours is, theirs is. But if yours is and you make it to heaven one day, my guess is you're going to meet these. Eternity is a long time. You're going to meet everybody at some point. There's going to be a moment where you're going to introduce yourself to somebody and say, oh, well, my name's Syntyche. And you're going to go, oh, I've read about you. <laughs> right? It's going to happen. It is an eternal public I mean, he puts them on blast in front of everybody. That's what he does here. We don't know what the issue is between them. Paul doesn't tell us it's not really that important. But here's what I glean from this right here. We, we do know that this, that this is not about some terrible doctrinal issue where one of them's right and one of them's wrong, one of them's in, one of them's out. He says they're both in. Be of the same mind in the Lord. They are both in the Lord. They are both followers of Jesus. They are both in the Lord. No one's being handed over to Satan here. No one's being called to repent here. Paul isn't even siding with either one of them. He just says, look, you need to be of the same mind. Have the same spirit. Be one in spirit and purpose. Strive together. That's what he's calling them to. And again, we don't know what the issue is, but I've, I think the, the point for us to take away is that there is a way that we can disagree 
And maybe both of us be right, but in the way that we're disagreeing, it makes us both wrong. He's pleading with both of them here. There there are things that we can disagree on, but if you are in Christ, there should be nothing else that trumps that. That we humble ourselves and put one another above the other for the sake of the gospel. So Paul pleads with him, figure this out, ladies. Have the same mind. Get on the same page. Stop trying to get your way. Strive together for the sake of the faith. You can't be striving together when you're fighting with each other. You can't be striving together when you're fighting to get your way. So Paul calls them out. But here's the reality. As humans, there are sometimes we just can't seem to get on the same page. We, we can't figure out how to, how to seek the common ground with the people that we're frustrated with or in a disagreement with. Paul calls for unity. And so to get there, he invites a third party to intervene. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul calls on his true companion. Some of your Bibles say, my, my loyal yoke fellow. There's somebody in the church, probably a leader, maybe the guy reading the letter, maybe the pastor of the church. And Paul says, I'm calling on you to help these women. Sometimes we need a third party arbitrator to help us find the common ground. And that's what Paul calls for here. Sometimes, even when you have two Jesus-loving God followers... We need somebody else to help us through our disagreements. The most important thing is not about getting your way. The most important thing is striving together, being united, having the same mind, being one and spirit and purpose. And you can't do that when you're fighting to get your own way. So here's the simple application for you today. Who do you need to make amends with? Who do you need to get on the same page with? Who do you need to be reconciled to? Who do you need to find unity with? Maybe it's somebody in this church. Maybe it's somebody in your last church. But you need to figure out because we are in the Lord that trumps everything else. So I will surrender myself. I'll humble myself for your sake and the gospel. This is so important. If the Lord has put somebody in your mind like right now, yeah, I probably ought to do that. Then you better do that. You better do that. You got to get this fixed. You got to get this fixed. And that's not just a suggestion from the pastor. That is a command from your Savior. Do you remember Jesus said, hey, if you find yourself at the altar bringing your sacrifice and you realize in that moment that there's someone who has something against you, not that you have someone, something against someone, somebody has something against you, then leave your gift at the altar, get out of line, and go fix it. And then when you've done that, then come back and offer your sacrifice. Leave your gift and then come back. It's that important. Jesus says, don't come in here thinking that you're going to worship God and think that all things are good with you and God when you have something broken with another person. You stop giving your worship now. Get out of line and go fix that and then come back and bring your sacrifice. It's that important to Jesus. So go get it fixed. So that's sermon number one. Here's number two. (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, what does the word always mean? Not a trick question, right? It means always. And it's that little word. If this word was gone, this verse would be a lot easier. But it's this little word always that makes this verse seem almost impossible. Rejoice in the Lord always. Always means in every situation you find yourself in. In every circumstance you find yourself in. Paul says rejoice in the Lord even in that. Rejoice in the Lord always means rejoice always. Now I want to make sure and point out the fact that it doesn't say rejoice In all circumstances. That's not what it says. It says rejoice in the Lord. No matter the circumstance. 
We don't rejoice in the circumstance. Rejoice in the Lord who is over the circumstances. Because here's the truth. We may be in some circumstances we don't like. But we are always in the presence of the Lord that we love. So we rejoice in the Lord no matter the circumstance. Our circumstance will change. Our God will never change. So we rejoice in the Lord, not in our circumstances. Our circumstances are sometimes good and sometimes bad, but our God is always good. As a counterintuitive as it sounds, it is often when our circumstances are bad that we see that our God is good. This past Friday, I got to go have lunch with a friend who... um, went on vacation with his family this past, about a month ago. And they were headed down to Rocky Point in New Mexico, and as they're crossing the border, he had a, remembered all of a sudden that there was a pistol that he had stuck under the front seat of his truck for a camping trip a month and a half before. That's not a big deal when you're in Arizona, right? Half of y'all got firearms on your pocket right now. <laughs> But when you're going into Mexico, it's a huge deal. It's federal offense. And immediately he and his wife are arrested. Their kids are taken by some friends. And and they don't know what's going to happen. The typical typical detention time for that in Mexico is anywhere from a month to six months. It's a huge deal in a Mexican prison. And he's sharing this story with me. It it was about an hour and a half as he's just downloading the memories of all of the things that happened in those moments. But what stood out to me is that I think he said they ended up spending something like 11 days in a federal prison in Mexico. As people from all over Mexico and Arizona were trying to help behind the scenes to figure out how to get them out and get them back with their family and back into the States. But that stuff doesn't happen quickly. They spent 11 days there. And one of the things that blew my mind as he's telling me this story was he said, there's been two big faith markers, these times in my life that have been these, these anchors of my faith. And this is one of them. And I'm blown away to think in that circumstance that he saw the goodness of God in the midst of it. And he tell, with tears in his eyes says, I would never want to go through that again. But given the chance today, I wouldn't change it because of the way that it marked my life. Because oftentimes... It's in our worst circumstances, when circumstances are bad, that we see how good our God is. When everything else got stripped away, he said, I had nothing. There was nothing. I didn't have a book, a magazine. There was no TV, no cell phones. There was nobody to talk to. I was in a cell. There was nothing to stimulate my mind. When everything else got stripped away and only Jesus was left, he found that Jesus was enough. No matter our circumstance, we can rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Why? Because the Lord is near. Because the Lord is near. The more time I spend talking with people who are hurting, like really hurting, the more I'm convinced that God shows up in supernatural ways when people are hurting. That his presence is more real, it's more palatable, it's more accessible. Again, my friend told me, as I'm sitting on the the metal bed that that is bolted to the wall with a little thin mattress, he said, I literally, as I'm sitting there, I would feel, it felt like Jesus was on that bed with his arm around me. Reminded me of his goodness. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Does that happen every time and every hurt for every person? No, maybe not. But just because we don't feel like that thing is true doesn't mean that it's not true. The Lord is near. That's the promise. 
And because of this, don't miss the connection here. The Lord is near, so do not be anxious about anything. Those two phrases are connected in your scriptures. The Lord is near, so do not be anxious about anything. So here's sermon number three. How many of you have a tendency to walk with anxiety? Any anxious people in the room? How many of you are now anxious because I'm calling out your anxiety? (laughs) I'm in this camp, all right? This is me. I can get really anxious at times. Which is crazy to say out loud. Because I want you to just think about this with me for a second. Like we live in one of the safest cities, safest states, and safest nations on the entire planet. Like poverty and hunger globally is at an all-time low. I don't know if you knew that. That's actually true. We have more disposable income than any people have ever had as a culture. You have more disposable time than any person on the, in the history of people. You are not thinking about how to survive today. Like you're not, you're not peddling your life to just survive today. You have the privilege of being bored. You have so much disposable time, you get bored. You don't even know what to do with all of your disposable time. We have the most advanced medical care since humans were created. You boomers are going to live longer and healthier than any generation that has ever come before you. By nearly any metric that we can count, we are better off than every other person that has ever come before us. Yet, at the same time, we are the most anxious people who have ever existed. We're on more meds and therapies than any any culture that's ever existed. How do those things go together? How do we fix that? I think one of the ways that we fix it is that we remember, at least for those of us in this room, we remember the Lord is near. The Lord is near. Have you ever had a moment where one of your kids like freaks out and gets really scared and it's dark or whatever, or they had an accident or something happened with a friend and they're just like, their anxiety is through the roof and you have that moment where you just grab your kid and you say, and you hold them tight and you say, it's okay, mommy's here. It's okay, daddy's here now. Do you know why you say that? Because it works. Because it works. Because your presence in that moment, it makes all the difference. When you say, Daddy's here, all of a sudden the the fear can fade. And nothing else in the circumstance may be different at all. Nothing in the circumstance may change. But your presence in the middle of that fear becomes enough. That's what Paul's telling us here. You don't have to be anxious because the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything because the Lord who is over everything is near. But he doesn't just leave us with that. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, every situation includes whatever causes your anxiety today. Every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So here's the second tool in our toolbox to deal with our anxiety. The first is just remembering the Lord is near. I mean, again, just the Lord is near. So here's step two. Talk with him like he's near. Pray. Petition. Ask him for what you're longing for and do it with thanksgiving because even in the midst of this awful situation, there's something to be thankful for. He's shown up again and again. He's provided again and again. So bring your petitions with thanksgiving and present your request to God. It sounds like kind of a cliche, right? Paul says, if you're anxious, just pray. You probably had people do that. And then you're angry, just pray. You're like, I do pray. Chances are, if you walk in anxiety, 
you pray when things are going sideways and you're fearful and scared and frustrated and stressed. You spend a lot of time praying. But it isn't just about recycling that same prayer. He says, here's what you need to do at the end. Actually present your request to God. Pre present your request to God. I think of it like this. I think when I hear that word present, I think about like at an awards ceremony, when somebody has an award and they take the award and they say, and we present this whatever award to such and such. Oh, yeah. But what is happening in that moment is somebody has something and they give it to somebody else. That's what it means to present something. You present it. You take it from your hands and you put it into somebody else's hands. Paul says, that's what you do. In your anxiety, don't be anxious. Pray, petition, give thanks, and then take that thing and present those requests to God. Remove them from your hands and put them into his. And I wonder how much our lives would be different if we took all the stress and anxiety and frustrations and we handed them over to our Father. That's the imagery here. You pray. You petition, but ultimately you present them to the God who knows you and loves you and, and let him do with them what he will. Imagine what a weight could be lifted off of your own soul if we actually put that into practice. You know what you would experience in that moment instead of anxiety? Peace. Peace. Not because I say so. And the peace of God, when you present those requests, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you hand those over, the peace of God is the gift he gives you back. He says it will guard your hearts and guard your minds. Which again, begs the question, what's the point of a guard? What does a guard do? A guard determines who gets in and who gets out. Right? Right? A guard at a jail keeps the convicts in and lets the visitors out. That's what a guard does. That's the point of a guard. You have a guard at a concert or a, a, a football game. They let the, a security guard will let the ticketed people in and keep the unticketed people out. A guard at a federal building or a courthouse or a whatever, a guard is standing there and they let authorized people pass through. Unauthorized people have to stay out. That's the whole point of a guard. And he says, look, when you hand over those requests to God, the peace of God will act as a guard for your heart, a guard for your mind. Helping to keep out what needs to stay out and let in what needs to be let in. That's the point of a guard. But it's really important. You and I have a role to play in this part. Look at the next verse. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's the command for you. There, there are things that you need to think about. And when it comes to anxiety, it is not enough to just not think about the bad things. You have to start thinking about better things. It is not enough for you to simply try to resist your anxieties. You have to begin to replace those anxieties. It's the old adage, right? If I tell you, don't think about white elephants. You ain't thought about white elephants until right now. This is the problem with us rolling our anxieties in our mind. We just say, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And every time you say, I'm not thinking about it, you're thinking about it. We can't just resist them. We have to replace them. And Paul here gives us a list of the kinds of things we are to replace these thoughts with. He gives us a filter for them. And he begins with saying, you need to think about whatever's true. And this one is like, 
If, if your anxiety is anything like mine, most of the greatest anxieties that I've ever had have centered around things that aren't even true yet. Like, I ain't even, they're, they haven't even happened. They're not even real. They're not true. Things haven't even come to pass. How much of your worry would go away if you just made the requirements, I'm only going to think about things that are true. But he doesn't leave it at that. This is like a filter, all right? Think of it like a funnel. Like the big end of the funnel is just think about the things that are true. That's the big end. And if it, if it doesn't make its way through the funnel, it's got to go. It's a thought that doesn't stay, right? And so the true part is the big end of the funnel, and it's just going to get narrower and narrower as we go. Whatever's true, but also whatever is noble, whatever's uplifting, whatever is lofty, as opposed to things that are lowly and ignoble. Think about things that are right. In other words, things that are honorable, just, fair, honest, instead of things that are corrupt and false and faulty. Think about things that are pure, pure, things that are holy, things that are sanctified, things that are uncontaminated, instead of what is impure, adulterated, tainted, defiled. Think about things that are lovely, things that are beautiful, attractive, pleasing, not dirty and distasteful and vile. Think about things that are admirable, commendable, worthy of respect, exemplary, not deplorable and disgraceful and shameful. Think about things that are excellent or magnificent or supreme, noteworthy, not inferior or awful or atrocious. Think about things that are praiseworthy, things that actually are worthy of praise from God. Now, my guess is, if you're like me, you read this list, and if you've been in church world very long, it's like, oh, I need to spend more time thinking about God's Word, because that fits. And that's true. That's true. That's good. But it goes beyond that. You know that, right? Did you see the other word? Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. When Paul wrote this, none of the people in Philippi had a Bible on their shelf. He wasn't thinking when he wrote this just about the Word of God. That's a great place for us, but there's more than that. God created the world and he stepped back at the end and said, it is good. There were lots of things that were noble and right and pure and lovely in the world that God created and they're still here. We just have to sift through the crap the world has to offer and find them. We just got to go find them. And so think of it again. Think of it like a funnel. And all of the thoughts that come in have to make it through the, through the funnel. Because here, here's how this works. I mean, you put a thought in. And if it makes it through, then you get to keep it. And if you don't, it has to go. Because here's the deal. There are some thoughts that may be true. Like your wife says... How do these pants make me look? <laughs> and the thought you have in that moment may be true, but it's not praiseworthy, right? So it doesn't make it through the list, and it's got to go. Some of you men may be thinking, think about whatever is lo- like whatever is lovely, because like the hot girls of Instagram are lovely. Yeah, it may make it that far, but is it pure? If it's not, it's got to go. (laughs) What the people in the break room are saying about the boss may be 100% true, and you may want to pile on. It may be true, but is it admirable? You think about your favorite cable news station, right? And you say, well, they're right. My favorite cable news station are right. Those people over there, they're a news station. Not right. They're wrong. They're peddling lies. My people are right. Here's what I know. I don't care what cable news station you normally watch. Here's what I want to ask for you. Whether they're right or not is irrelevant to me in this moment. Would anybody look at any of the cable news and say, oh yeah, my cable news, what they do on my favorite cable news, they are honorable. They are noble. Anybody calling your cable news noble? No, it's not noble. 
But yeah, we fill our minds with these things. And here's the last thing I'll say about this one. This is not scientific, but I'm guessing it's somewhere around 94.6% of everything that you've ever seen on your social media feed would not fit through this funnel. Maybe higher. I mean, if we just talk about what's true, everybody lies on their social media. Is it noble? Is it admirable? Praiseworthy? Lovely? No. And I wonder if, if, it's, if just this, if we just got rid of that one piece, wouldn't, wouldn't make most of our anxieties just go away. It isn't enough just to get rid of the bad thoughts. You can't resist. You have to replace what we're thinking about. And this is the funnel to run those thoughts through. Paul ends with this. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is the third time in this little letter where Paul has said, just follow my example. Whatever you've seen, whatever you've heard, whatever I've taught you, just do what I've done. Do what you have seen. Again, don't miss this. Whatever you've learned, whatever you've received, whatever you've heard, whatever you've seen, put it into practice. Put it into practice. In other words, it doesn't matter what you have learned. It doesn't matter what you have received. It does not matter what you have heard. And it doesn't matter what you have seen if you don't apply it to your life. You can receive it all, you can learn it all, you can see it all, and you can hear it all and feel good about yourself. It makes no difference until you put it into practice. You got to put it into practice. How many of you want the God of peace to be with you? It's not a rhetorical question. I got one hand in the back. How many of y'all... What does he tie to the God of peace being with you? It's connected to putting into practice what you've learned, what you've received, what you've heard, and what you've seen. That is what happens. You get the God of peace when you put that into practice. As we said last week, if you want to grow, do what you know. You don't need another sermon or Bible study or mentor or small group or podcast. Most of us just need to be obedient to what we've learned, received, heard, and seen. So the application is simple today. Whatever you have learned in this message, whatever you've received from God today, whatever you've heard from the Word, whatever you've seen from the text, put it into practice. And the promise of God's word is the God of peace will be with you. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that we are not alone, that you have promised you will never leave us and you will never forsake us, that your presence is with us. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And so I pray today that we would act as if the Lord is near. That we'd dispel the anxieties, that we'd live in unity, that we would walk with the peace that comes when we put your word into practice. And so convict us today. Show us what the application is for us specifically, not for anyone else, but for us to put into practice what we've heard and what we've seen. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.